real quickly, address, I will I will address some common misunderstandings that students are having. Okay. Um, so, for example, some of you wrote in your notes that children's children's brains grow quickly. Not true. Okay. Children's brains, in fact, human brains, do not grow very much at all after birth. Okay, so after birth, with, within about the time of birth, basically within, around, around the time of birth, is when children and humans have the most number of neurons. The greatest number of neurons is basically around the time of birth. Okay, so you have many, many neurons. Okay, we're just going to call these neurons here. Okay, around the time of birth, and you have basically the the greatest number of connections. Okay, synaptic connections. Uh, around the time of birth, okay? Now, certainly children learn very quickly, okay? And what that is, is that, let's say that we have input coming in to the neurons, is that the connections become stronger, <coughs> is it right? Or, weaker very quickly for children, okay? So children do not gain new neurons. Children do not gain many new synaptic connections, synapse between the neurons, okay, after birth. So mostly what learning, what learning is, is a strengthening and a weakening of connections. And for children, this strengthening and weakening of connections happens very quickly compared to adults. It also happens for adults as well. It's called plasticity, okay? But for us, it's very slow, okay? So think about this, is that learning, a lot of learning is loss, losing, okay? When we learn, we're actually losing in some respect. We're also gaining, particularly in a cultural sense, we're gaining, but so a, a lot of learning, a lot of learning is that we strengthen connections, and when we strengthen connections, we also then lose other connections or make other connections weaker. And this is why learning a second language is difficult, is because we've already made some connections. Let's say these are Korean connections stronger, and when we make Korean connections stronger, then the other connections for learning a language are less, so then when we try to learn English, it's more difficult, okay? So just so you know, children's brains do not really grow, okay? Uh, there are some situations in which we get new neural cells. So um, we, we do not need to teach children how to learn. We do not need to teach children how to learn. Children learn all the time. We are learning machines. Okay? Although I don't like the, the metaphor learning machine. Okay? But we are. We are learning machines. We do not need to teach anyone how to learn. Right now, I want you to all, I want you to all stop learning. Okay? Try to stop learning right now. Go ahead and try. Try. <laughs> Try to stop learning right now. Can you control that? You cannot control that. You can't just say to yourself, oh, well now I'm not going to learn. You're always learning. It's a biological function, okay? So we do not need to teach. I just said the end I'm trying to say okay less, because I always say okay, okay? All right, so. Uh, uh, a lot, some of you talked about parents, and that parents are always talking to children. Okay, true. Par parents are often talking to children, but just so you know, the research shows 
that in the home, children start much more than 50% of all the conversations. So all the conversations between parents and children, children start more than half, much more than half, actually. Okay? So it's not so much parents always talking to children, it's more children talking to parents. And then parents responding and being responsive to the children. Okay? And again, think about how that might apply to education. Okay? Because the home is very successful for helping children learn a language. Okay? But it's not so much parents talking to children. Yes, parents talk to children, usually giving directions. Go wash your hands. Get ready for dinner. Put on your pajamas. You want to do something. Okay? But for the most part, children are starting the conversations usually. Okay? All right. So today's topic is the prerequisites of symbolic language and language acquisition. Everyone knows the word prerequisite? P-R-E means before. Requisite means require. So things we require. Things we require before. Before symbolic language. These are the things we must have to, for us to have symbolic language or for symbolic language to emerge. Okay. And I want you to please keep in mind through the course of this lecture is that the struggle to communicate is most important for language acquisition. The struggle, the fighting, the trying, the trying to communicate is what helps us learn language. Not successfully communicating, although that is very important, and as is failure. Failure and success are both important, but it's more the struggle. Does everyone understand struggle? Uh, Joy, I forgot to tell you in the last class, for, I forgot to uh, make note of the students who were sleeping in the last class. Mm -hmm. right? uh, so remind me after class. I could probably okay. tell from their notes. Okay, well, that's true. I saw a couple. Okay, so children and learning a language. Do children learn a language from listening to people talk? Do you learn language from listening to people talk? Yes or no? Yes. No. Okay, for example, let's learn German. Okay? Das ist mein Hund. 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 Oh, Alright, do you remember? Okay. So, okay, good. Okay. But again, like the idea is that I could say that for a very, very, very long time and you would never learn anything. Okay? You would be able to, of course, replicate the um, the sounds, but you could you wouldn't learn the meaning. Um, however, good. If I were to bring through gesture and I say hunt, hunt, das ist mein hunt, hunt, hand, yeah, da, this is my hand. Did you remember from freshman year? No, okay, because Sean did this in his freshman year actually. But okay, so again though. We use gesture here now to be able to bring some meaning to it, okay? And then you bring, wow, it is hot in here. And then you bring your understanding. So for example, das ist mein Hand sounds very similar to this is my hand, which you know the English. So you bring your understanding, and then we have this kind of a uh, gesture that then, uh, you know, within the context, you're able to then understand the language. So this is why Good Morning Pops radio program, Good Morning Pops, waste of time, okay? Maybe it's good for entertainment if you already can speak English or if you already know what they're talking about. But if you don't know Korean or English, Good Morning Pops is a complete waste of time. Don't do it. Sleep more. Probably better, better idea, okay? These are the necessities for symbolic language. These five points here. One, two, three, four, five. You don't understand. That's okay. For bringing it to your attention, you're very welcome. Thank you for saying thank you.
constraint. You don't understand constraint. That's okay. It took me a very long time to understand constraint. Years. And even now I don't understand constraint. So don't worry. But constraint is a necessary characteristic of things, of everything. We need constraint. When I say a sound, for example, O, O, or I say a sound, E, E, O and E are different, yes? Okay, that means that there is a constraint, is that in the sound, in the, the frequency of the sound, there is a constraint. This is O, this is E, they are not the same. Okay, so a constraint is a kind of, what, what is a constraint? A <coughs> restriction or constriction or um, some kind of pulling something together, okay? For us to have sounds, for us to, for you to, right now, to see this marker, okay? This marker, you can see this marker, this marker is separate from this. That is constraint. Everything has constraint, all right? Our bodies have constraint, okay? Here's Damon's body, okay? Even though Damon's body is changing all the time, okay? I'm brushing off many of my skin cells. My skin cells replace themselves every 22 days, okay? Every 22 days, all my skin is different than 22 days ago. So I'm changing. I'm constantly changing, but at the same time, though, this is Damon's body. You know this is Damon. That is a form of constraint. Okay? Constraint applies to everything. Okay? We have physical grounding. Physical grounding. Meaning or understanding originates from the physical world. Now, this, is, this is very important <coughs> for us to understand language. Okay? Because this has been a long debate for many years. Okay? is that for us to understand something, the understanding must come from the physical world. Okay? For example, if something is scary, if something is scary, how do you know it is scary? It's scary because it facilitates hormones within your system that may give you a feeling, an emotional feeling. Okay? That is an example of physical grounding. Is that Understanding or meaning comes from the physical world and very connected with, with emotions and hormones, just so you know. We have embodiment. Embodiment just means a physical body. I have a body. You have a body. A body is necessary for language. You must have a body for you to be able to understand language, for you to understand symbols. I won't talk about it too much because it's really complicated. Um, but again, we've talked about before in class, for example, time. Okay, I'm standing here. Where is the future? Here, here, or here? Okay, where is the past? Where is the present? Okay, we, our physical body ends up playing a role in helping us understand the world. Okay, and also understand, um, allowing us to coordinate symbols. But anyway, we'll get into this, okay? It's interesting, we won't do it too much. Situatedness, okay? Situated just means to be in a situation. To be in an environment, to be in a context. We need to have an environment. We need to have a context to help us understand symbols, to help us understand meaning. Sociability. We need sociability. We talked about it last week, why it is necessary and how it allows us uh, to uh, share meaning. Okay? We need to have sociability because this is the motivation for us to communicate. It allows us to then to uh, coordinate uh, symbolic categories. Okay. So let's try to understand a little bit about constraint. Again, is this is very difficult. So don't worry. Can anyone see see anything in this picture, in this image? 
don't worry if you can't, I can't. But some people can, especially if you look at it for a long time. Okay? Right, it look, right now it just looks very blurry, right? Did anyone see anything? You can see it. Man, that is so, you're so, how can you do that so quickly? I had one other student who was able to see it very quickly, like you. Okay, so she's able to, there's a, it's like a 3D, yeah, kind of 3D face. If you look at this, probably for a long time, or some people for a short time, we're all different, we have different kinds of brains, um, that you will be, maybe be able to see a 3D face. This is the idea of constraint. If there is no constraint, then it is all just like noise. Okay? But with some constraint, we then are able to see things, or hear things, or identify, ah, this is smooth, not rough. Okay? So these are the ideas of constraint. Okay? So constraints allow us categories. If things constrain themselves, it allows us a category, a categorization. Okay? Um, and again, some people have, you and the other girl who saw it, probably your, your personality types are probably very similar. Uh, uh, not in this class, it's a different class. But you and that other girl probably have very similar personality types. This is my guess, I'm guessing. Okay, so here we have categories. Okay, for example, uh, what color am I pointing at? Blue. Okay, what color am I pointing at? Okay. Uh, pink would probably be a little whiter. I'd probably put this in purple. Um, what color is this? Okay, deep wow. blue, dark blue, navy blue. Okay, when, okay, so here's dark blue, navy blue, here's purple. What color is this? Oops. Here maybe dark purple, violet, okay. What color is this? Okay, do you see my point here? Is that these categories are not easy. These categories are not, oh, this is pink, this is purple. Okay? It's very gray, it's very blended together, but is this purple? Yes. Is this navy blue? Yes. Okay? We do have categories. Categories are real, okay? But at the same time, though, they're not clear. They're very difficult. So just keep that in mind, okay? Just keep that in mind. Okay? Well, the difference between yellow and green. Okay? Just keep in mind, these things are not, it's not, these, these categories are not simple categories. Um, and this applies to knowledge, just so you know. Okay? This applies to knowledge and knowledge formation. This is just another example of that. I'm going to skip that. Okay. So, is this moving? Is it moving? Really? It seems to be moving. Okay. So, again, this is to help us, these, these categories, if we were to put this in a category of stationary or not moving and moving, some of you might say moving, some of you might say not moving, and, you know, technically five we would say not moving, but the way that it interacts with your eye and your brain is that it looks like it might be moving, okay? And this shows us that, again, our body is in constant interaction with the environment, okay? So this is our body, embodiment, in constant interaction with our environment, the situatedness, and it's always, it's always happening, every second, every moment, every day. And this affects then categorization and understanding and knowledge and meaning. Okay? So here we have a word such as lemon. Now again, hopefully everyone's taking good notes. If anything, anything you're thinking about, make sure you're writing down your notes because the notes are for you, okay. particularly. So here we have a word lemon. Okay? Everyone understands the word lemon? Okay. And if we were just taking, just doing code switching, right? Lemon, hunger, lemon, or lemon, okay? That's just a code switch. This is a very easy code switch. How can you understand, but how can you really understand this word? Eating. Okay, probably from eating and tasting lemon. How else? Seeing a lemon, maybe 
touching a lemon, if, I mean, you can even think about the feeling of it. If I say the word lemon, 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 many times, probably your mouth begins to get more water in it. You are having a very physical response to this word. That's how you can understand this word. That's where meaning comes from. Okay, a lemon. Even just looking at that picture probably creates a, uh, gets you salivating a little bit more. It's a little more water coming. Okay, and this relate, and again, this is really difficult. Don't worry, just take good notes, you'll do just fine. Okay, don't worry. Just try to understand it. Constraint and conceptual grounding. Again, how do we understand something? Through the physical world, through our physical bodies, and constraints. Constraints allow for categories, categorization. For example, what is this? Apple, what is this? By the way, what is this? This is an apple. <laughs> Golden, golden, delicious. Okay. Apple. What is this? Apple. Okay, so these are all the same, but you said they're all apples. Okay, so again, we have here a concept, the concept of apple, okay, and all of these get kind of blended together. Remember, these categories are not clear, they're not clean. Okay, same as what is yellow, what is green, and where do they change between yellow and green. But at the same time though, I agree, these are all apples, okay? And we have an understanding of apples, right? Well, right, the same as okay. Uh, we have an understanding of apples that come from us eating apples, seeing apples, smelling apples, tasting apples, and this, re this de allows us to develop our concept of apples, okay? Our kind of schema. Probably all of you have learned about schema in your classes, right? So a concept is a clustering, a categorization. And again, this is all subconscious, muishi, okay? Uh, sensor motor, sensor motor just means our, our senses, tasting, touching, seeing, etc. Sensor motor experience. Concepts are essentially ongoing yet continually modifying associations and schema how we understand things, okay? And our schema, are, these are body-based, body-based schema, okay? How we understand the world is related to our physical body and the way we experience the world, okay? And again, this experience is very interesting, right? This experience can be very confusing even. Okay, so, now, all of us, we all agree that these are apples, all of us, we have eaten the same apples? We've eaten the same apples? Yeah. Yes? I bet you guys never had a golden delicious. Guess what? Golden delicious is very delicious. Okay. So, we all agree that those are apples, but we have not all eaten the same apples. Okay? Each individual has her or his own independent conceptual network. Your network is different than my network. Yours is different than mine, yours is different than mine because we've all had different experiences. Okay? But we're also all connected together as we talked about last week with empathy and mirror neurons that maybe replicate things, of course. There are similarities among the individual networks. Okay? So my network, my conceptual, my schema, is similar to your schema. Why? Why is my schema similar to your schema? Okay, excellent. Biological similarities. I have two hands, I have two ears, I have two eyes, I have a tongue, I have a nose, I have 15 hairs. Okay? So these are similarities of embodiment, and we also have similarities of situatedness, okay? We have all had very similar experiences. All of you have sat in classrooms before. I have also sat in a classroom before. Many of you have ridden in a car. I have also ridden in a car. So we do have similarities in our experiences. Similarities in our genetics and similarities in our experiences. 
Each network is unique. All of you are unique. All of you are special. Given differences in biological development, all of us in our bio and the way that we've grown has been a little bit different because we've all had different life experiences. The network is continuously undergoing dynamic change depending upon experience within and interaction with the world. Our understanding of the world is constantly changing every moment, every second, a little bit, a little bit. Sometimes we have those really big life-changing events as well, okay? But it's always changing. Keep this in mind. The way that we understand the world, our knowledge, our categories, are constantly changing. If you eat a new kind of apple, a new, maybe you've never had a Golden Delicious, but now you have a Golden Delicious, you're going to change your concept. Your concept's going to change a little bit, okay? So we are all unique. But at the same time, though, we also all share concepts as well, okay? We have semiotic networks. Semiotics, semiotics is the study of how symbols, how symbols have meaning. Okay, how does a symbol have a meaning? A symbol, give me an example of a symbol. Absolutely, that's absolutely a symbol. Excellent. And language be a little more specific, though. You have letters. Letters are visual symbols. But you also have sounds. Ah, uh, yo. Okay. Sounds are also symbols. Because those sounds don't have really any meaning beyond the sound, right? Sounds are also symbols. These are phonetic, phonetic symbols. So we have symbols. Okay, now if I say, I'm going to say a symbol, beach, beach, everyone understands? Beach, you understand? Okay, so because you understand, that means that you have a concept, you have some kind of understanding of the symbol, the phonetic sound, beach, when Damon says beach. So here, the symbol, the sound, beach, is connected with a concept with your understanding, okay? And this concept, how do you understand this concept? Everyone, have you been to a beach? Yeah? yeah? So then that concept is connected to the real thing, okay? This is kind of our semiotic network, or a semiotic network of triangle, okay? Uh, don't worry about methods, because I don't even understand that. Okay, so just to make it a little more simple, Simply put, symbols become neurologically and as an extension hormonally. Maybe your feeling about beach is a good feeling because you had good experiences at the beach. Or maybe you hate the sun and your hormonal experience was a very negative, bad feeling. I don't know. Okay? So we have the symbol, beach. Here is the visual symbol, beach. It ends up becoming connected to our experience on the real beach, okay? Or I'm sorry, here's our experience. Our experience defines our concept, okay? So this is connected to our concept, okay? The symbol becomes connected to our experience at the beach, our body-based experience at the beach. And this, then, is how we are able to then understand a symbol such as beach. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, we can think this is very connected to our emotions as well. Right? So we can understand then how maybe an advertising company or a corporation can then use this understanding okay, to then influence your decision making. Okay? So McDonald's 
blows their uh, french fry smell out of their window on purpose so that you then, when you walk past McDonald's, you smell the french fries as you are walking past McDonald's and you see their sign, it makes you hungry because when we smell food, we naturally get hungry. And so then, when you see that sign, it stimulates the hormonal or emotional desire to eat. And they do this, on, I mean, certainly it's on purpose, and, and it's, a lot of people do things that are even less obvious, okay? Now we're going to move towards how we are able to, for, for children at a very young age, be able to, to take, to be able to begin to form categories, shared categories. Okay? And it starts, our understanding is that it starts through language games. Okay? Of course it starts, there's no start, no end, but uh, it begins with language games, primarily with children. Okay? Language games integrate a variety of systems, vision, gesture, speech production and reception, and responsive action. Okay? I'm gonna we might a language game in Korea would be ko 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 pi ko 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 nu ko 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 ki okay and the child will mimic that and begin to mimic the sounds and begin we then begin to categorize what is it what is ko what is pi Okay, in America, we also do other things as well. We say, for example, mothers or fathers will take their child and go, patty cake, patty cake, for baker's bread. Bake a cake as fast as you can. Roll it, roll it, and throw it in a pan. Mark it with deep or game in it. Okay. These are games that parents play with their kids. Again, we are connecting, increasing the bonds. But then at the same time, we're also adding language and sound and music to these very simple games. And these begin to form the schema, socially shared, culturally shared schema uh, uh, in children. And just so you know, this is all, this is all theory, okay? because everything's theory. It's all theory, but um, there has been research in the last 10 years using AI, artificial intelligence, to, to kind of support this theory of embodiment, situatedness, physical grounding, sociability, and the, uh, whatever the other one was. What was the other one? I forgot what I said. But anyways, this is some interesting research by uh, Dr. Okay. Let's look at some other interaction that we have. And again, keep in mind these ideas of embodiment, physical grounding, situatedness, sociability, uh, and constraint. Yeah, but we're not going to constraints too. Don't worry about that. Okay. So this is a real conversation. This is a real conversation. They put microphones in the home uh, for actually many years. This is a British study. Okay, so here we have this mother, and the mother and the child. The mother says, now we're nearly dressed. Okay now, over your head, good boy. Put in your other hand, now shoes, where are your shoes? The child says, Seuss. The mother says, yes, your shoes, where are they? And both of them look around for the shoes. Oh look, your shoes, on the chair, Seuss. Soothe, yes, shoot. Okay? We can see that this interaction is happening in a situation, in a context. What is the context? Neyo, roommate, what is the context? Louder. Putting, putting on clothes. Otiba, yeah, okay. <laughs> putting on clothes, getting ready to go outside. We have a context. The mother is helping the child. Does the mother say, repeat after me, shoes? No. The child repeats language naturally without, without the mother saying, you know, repeat after me. Notice that the mother says, over your head. How can a child understand over your head? How can the child understand? 
seeing the mother's action, and probably also she says this as she's pulling the sweater over his head. So he is able to then connect the symbol or symbols over your head together with the action or the experience of over your head. Okay? I ah, did it again. Yeah, I keep and again, we can see how this works for shoes and chair. Now, also, the child's pronunciation good pronunciation or bad pronunciation? Not very good, right? So does the mother say, no, you stupid little child? <laughs> No. The mother just continues in her interaction with the child. And I'm sure, this was recorded many, many years ago, I'm sure that that child speaks perfect English or fluent English. Okay, We don't have to worry about these things. Don't worry, these constraints, these categories, they'll work themselves out. Okay, parents also will extend language and extend knowledge. For example, Mark is looking out the window. This is another real conversation that was recorded in the home. Mark says, look at that, birds, mummy, mother, hmm, birds, what are they doing? Birds bread, oh look, they're eating berries, aren't they? Yeah, that's their food, they have berries for dinner, oh, so the mother, was the mother, was the mother paying attention to the child, to Mark, in the beginning? Probably not, I don't think so, okay? Probably she's maybe doing something else, and Mark says, look at that, mummy, bird. Says, hmm? Birds. And then she's responsive to the child. Oh, what are they doing? Mark says, birds, bread. Is Mark, are the birds eating bread? No, the birds are eating berries. Mark was wrong, okay? Why, why did Mark say bread? Okay, probably his experience is that he eats bread. Maybe he hasn't eaten any berries. Excellent. Okay, so he brings his understanding. Again, the mother doesn't say, no, you stupid little child. It's not bread. They're berries. And again, think about how this applies to, ed to education in school, right? Because we often punish students for incorrect answers, right? Parents don't punish the children for incorrect answers, okay? They naturally correct them. And we can understand maybe why he said bread. Maybe he doesn't understand berries. Uh, one, in my last class, one student said, oh, maybe he meant to say berries, but instead bread came out. Okay, yeah, sure, maybe that happened too. So she says, oh, yeah, look, they're eating berries. So she then brings him to her, to, she brings her knowledge to what he's looking at. And then as well, she says, that's their food. They have berries for dinner. She then, ex so she goes to where he is. To what he's looking at, to what he's thinking about, she goes to where he is. She then defines in a, in a correct way what he is looking at, and then also extends. She extends the knowledge beyond probably where he is, his understanding. Okay, and you can think about ZPD, right? Vygotsky's ZPD, and how this maybe is a reflection of the ZPD. Okay, that's it. Okay. Again. It, and you can even also, by, excuse me, by the way, look here, you can see birds and bread. By the way, this is already the beginning of grammar. Because uh, you're not going to ever say bread, birds. Okay, the subject, object. Um, uh, there's a word for it. Okay, so making connections. What we're looking, what we're really looking at here is making connections between our body, our experience, these symbols, and the world, our experience within the world. Okay, in the previous examples, parents made connections between sounds, actions, and objects. And these sounds are, are symbols, okay, to create meaning within context. What Krashen, Dr. Krashen calls comprehensible input, as well as connecting to prior knowledge, life connections. Our life experiences. Parents understand this in children naturally, and they then a lot help children form these connections. So these are the traits of parents in interactions with children. Parents ask questions and provide answers. Okay. What is this? It's a bottle. It's a water bottle. What is this? It's a water bottle. Parents provide answers. If we only ask questions. 
what is this? What is that? What is that? If I only ask a question, what is this? That is a, it's a test. Okay, if we only ask questions, that is a test. It's a test of how does your knowledge match my knowledge, or my expectation of what your knowledge should be. You can see how that even ties into power as well. So parents ask questions and provide answers. We have to provide answers. That's how the children will learn. If the children already know answers, if the children know the child knows the answer, that's not learning. If the child knows the answer, that's not learning. Parents are responsive to the cues children provide as to what they are able to understand. Parents are very responsive to the children where the child is, so that then the parent can then work within the child's ZPD. Okay? Everyone remember ZPD? From your class? Yeah, Vygotsky, Vygotsky, and your zone of proximal development. And what we're talking about here. Okay? The child has their understanding. This is what they can understand with someone's assistance, and this is what they cannot understand. Parents are very good at going to where they are and then framing and extending knowledge that is within their ability to understand. Damon is not very good at this, right? I'm out here. I'm trying to teach you information that's maybe even beyond your understanding. This hopefully you take really good notes. Give it time. Parents incorporate what the child says and extends it. Okay? Parents are very responsive. Think about how this applies to school and education. Think about as being a teacher and how you can help children acquire language. All of this helps a child acquire a language. Last part, and we're finished. Adult agenda. Again, this is a real conversation. This is recorded in England, so biscuits equal cookies, okay? Cookies. So the boy is looking at the cookies. And Thomas said, biscuits. Cookies. Mother. Those were got specially because we had visitors at the weekend. Who came to see Tommy? Who came in a car? See Granny Irene a uh, car? Granny Irene's coming next weekend. But who came last weekend? Auntie Gail in a train? Auntie Gail's coming. They're coming on a train, yes. Colin uh, Ann a train? Colin and Ann came in the car, didn't they? Colin and Ann, Colin and Ann. Now, Thomas did talk, who? Who came in a car? Who came last weekend in a car? This is a test. Who came last weekend in a car? Colin and Ann. Okay, they came last weekend in a car. Did Thomas at answer the question correctly? No. Why not? Why do you think not? Any ideas why? thinking about cookies. He's thinking about eating cookies. The mother, is the mother thinking about eating cookies? No. The mother didn't go to where Thomas is in his mind. Okay? The mother's trying to bring him to what she's thinking about. And obviously that confuses him. Okay? Same as probably many of you are confused right now because David's trying to bring you to his understanding. So again, this is what we might recognize as adult agenda. Think about how adult agenda might apply within the classroom. What we might call teacher agenda. Okay? Instead of going to where the child is, going to where the learner is, the teacher is always trying to bring the learner to where they are. Probably not the best idea to facilitate learning. Okay? I'd like you to, at the bottom of your... Um, of your worksheet here. And by the way, uh, this week's topic, you can just write, um, you know, prerequisites of language or basics of language, something like that. It's week three.
I want you to answer the question. The question here, how do parents complement the foundations of, child, of a child's, I should say of a child's, language development? And then what is a question that you have that is somehow related to the lecture? Please answer those two or write, write your uh, responses and you can leave. Have a good afternoon.